school ministry. Pray for our teachers. Pray for our children. May God bless as he is blessing. Did you find Judges chapter 2? I invite you to follow along as I begin reading in verse 7. Judges chapter 2, verse 7. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. And they buried him within the border of his inheritance at timnath Hares in the mountains of Ephraim, on the north side of Mount Gash. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. Let's pray. Father, we see your hand working through human history working for your own ends and for your own purpose and bringing great glory to your own name. And we, Father, pray that thy spirit will guide us with understanding not only the history, but also understanding the times in which we live. And we seek, Father, to be equipped by you to be servants that are a marvelous testimony of the Most High God. Give us blessed understanding from your word this morning, for we look to you with thanksgiving in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This morning, I want to talk to us a little bit about the tragic consequence of not communicating faith in God to the next generation. We have that on display here in the book of Judges, the whole book. This, these verses that I've read from chapter 2 are merely an introduction to a sad history in the nation of Israel and that sad history we're told in verse 10 of chapter 2 is because there, uh, uh, there arose a generation that didn't know God. They didn't know him. They were past the generation who saw the works of the Lord, and many of that generation knew the Lord. And uh, we'll see from God's word today that there is a great responsibility placed upon believers to communicate, that is, to share, to give the truth of our faith to the next generation. And there are some challenges, and there are tremendous blessings to this. And on this Father's Day 2024, I want to speak about it because the Lord places that responsibility on us as men. That's who, it's not that we are to do it alone. Uh, God expects us to use all the resources that he has given to us. And praise the Lord for our wives and our mothers and our sisters and our aunts and our grandmothers. <laughs> But God places the responsibility upon us as men, fathers, to communicate our faith in God to the next generation. Here, we see something broke down. Something broke down, and that did not happen in the nation of Israel. And what we read about in the book of Judges are gross sins that became pervasive throughout the nation, resulting eventually in God's judgment falling upon these people because God, our Heavenly Father, as a loving Heavenly Father, chastens those whom he loves. And that's the responsibility of a father as well. And God, our Heavenly Father, never is late, never shirks, but is always diligent and faithful to fulfill his duty to the fullest, complete end. By the way, just to give you a little bit of uh, a view of the reality of that, here are believers in Jesus Christ today. And not just here, all over the globe. But for the grace of God, there would not be one. But for the grace of God. May we keep that in mind and appreciate what God our Heavenly Father does. But may we also listen from the scriptures to what God mandates as necessary that we might be faithful. You and I are living here, 2024, in times of great apostasy, times of great compromise, and times of great indifference. I didn't have to plan and prepare an illustration. Or yesterday when I went to my bank, there was a pride parade that was going past the bank. And in our time and in our day, there are those who are parading pride. I don't need to go into the details. I, I assume and have a good sense that everyone here knows all that's engaged today 
under the word of pride and parading pride. I would just have us be mindful. I would remind us that the word of God says in Proverbs chapter 6 and uh, in about four or five verses, I believe it's 16 through 19, the word of God tells us seven abominations. There are seven things that are detested by God. God hates these seven things. They're an abomination to God. These six things does the Lord hate. Yes, seven are an abomination. That's what the Word of God says. So I share that with you because uh, some people may get upset with me that I'm not tolerant or I'm not kind or I'm not loving. People give all kinds of words. But I'm just quoting to you, thus saith the Lord. This is what God says. And I do want to add to that, by the way, I, I just heartily agree with it because it's what God has said. The first thing on that list of seven abominations is a proud look or pride. That's number one. God hates pride. And so when we live in a time when pride is on parade, it ought to cause us to ask a question or two, don't you think? Biblically, it ought to. It ought to make us think. And when we see that what is being paraded is nothing but a gross list of what the Bible calls immorality. They are sexual sins. That's what the Bible says. That's what God calls it. God has a name for all different kinds of sins of immorality, whether it's homosexuality or bestiality, whatever. God condemns these practices because he created us and God created that uh, reproduction and marital oneness and enjoyment is defined by him as to take place between one man and one woman within the bonds of holy matrimony because God says in Genesis, he took the two and he made them one flesh. Jesus echoed that in Matthew chapter 19, the two, two become one. That's the work of God. And so within the marriage bond, which to God is a sacred bond that's only to be between one man and one woman according to the precepts of Scripture. And so anything other than that, and it was all on parade yesterday, it just reminded me that uh, the Scriptures are so accurate when Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3, 1, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. By the way, the list goes on. Lovers of money, disobedient, unthankful. The list goes on. But chief and up front is man loves himself. This is my way. Don't tell me I'm wrong. This is what makes me feel good. Don't tell me it isn't good. Maybe it's not good for you, we hear, but it's good for me. And I, I understand all that. I, I do. I, I understand that. The problem is, it's not about what you think or what I think. It's about what God says, our creator who made us. That's the issue. It's about what God says. And, and so what you think and what I think is right or wrong based on what God has said. Now, I know our culture takes great issue with that and especially wants to talk about, well, which Bible are you reading? Or how do I know which religion's right? Or I want to tell you God has answered all these questions. And you can find answers to each and every one of them if you want to know. Is the Bible right? Is God faithful? Has God worked and preserved a people for his holy name? All of that is revealed on the pages of Scripture. And you can know it's the Scripture because God gives prophecy sometimes hundreds of years before it ever happens. And then he fulfills it to the letter that he prescribed in the prophecy. He's demonstrated the truthfulness of his word again and again. And the, and the, the heart that wants to know can find answers. I want to give you great encouragement. And the word of God tells us that God has appointed a day in which he will judge all mankind. And he's going to bring forth that judgment by Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came to die and shed his blood to pay for our sins. That means it's not at the level of what you think and what I think, what you like and what I like. Though our culture tells us that truth is relative, God states in his word, truth is absolute. What God says is right, and anything opposite of it is wrong. And so while pride was on parade, and it is all around us this month, I was reminded that God calls pride an abomination. 
As a matter of fact, God tells us in the New Testament, James chapter 4, God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. God's grace, God's favor, God's kindness, and God's goodness is all bestowed on the person who will just humble themselves, acknowledge their sin, and turn to God to help me, Lord, and he'll help you like you've never experienced help ever before. Just talk to somebody in this room, and they'll share with you how good God is to those who love him. God is a gracious God. But we are living in a time of apostasy. We are living in a time of compromise. We are living in a time of indifference. Who knows what's right? How do you know what's right? Just do whatever, as long as I don't hurt you, as long as you don't hurt me. That's, why some reasons, that's one of the reasons why some people won't listen to a message like this. But we can't be indifferent. If there is a God and he's the creator, indifference is not something that is acceptable. It's either right or it's wrong. And the word of God tells us, choose, make a choice. That's the blessed, precious, holy responsibility that God has given to each and every one of us, is you get to choose. And I say choose wisely. Those who choose the Lord will certainly find his blessing. We read here in Judges chapter 2, and for those of you who know, nothing that's being paraded by the streets of Manchester, or, or sadly all around the United States this month, is anything new, you'll read right here in the book of Judges pretty much everything you see paraded. There's nothing new under the sun. Doesn't that wake you up? <laughs> Wakes me up. This is not new. The rebellion in the heart of man against God's will, God's ways, is as old as the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve chose to say no to God. We will do what we want to do. And that's exactly what we're hearing today, isn't it? No, don't tell me this is right or wrong. I will do what I want to do. But I want to, I want to admonish you that if you embrace that kind of thinking, you are moving towards a judgment with the Creator who will account, hold you accountable for what I am sharing right here now. And God makes it a point to make His truth known. That's, that's one of the reasons why we're still here today. Believers in the Lord, believers in his word, recipients of God's great grace. The nation of Israel got in a horrible place, and there was a generation that rose up, and here it is, they didn't know God. They didn't know him, and, and, and that's what we see all around us, is people who don't know God. They don't know his word. They don't know his ways, and so mankind will do what mankind will do. But the problem is this, the judgment of God follows those who despise him, and despise his ways. The scriptures are full of that. Well, this morning I want to remind us that the word of God tells us that as fathers we have a responsibility to communicate our faith to the next generation. It's a glorious privilege and an awesome responsibility. It is. The word of God says in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. That's what God has to say to the church. Fathers, I want you to teach and discipline your children to know me. Is that possible? It's a blessed possibility. And so we want to ask the question, how can we communicate our faith to the next generation? And I'm just going to give you three things real quick. Let me say them at the beginning. So if I get lost, you don't. Number one, a father must be a man of God. Number one, you must be a man of God. You cannot communicate knowledge of God to your children and grandchildren if you don't know God. And I am aware that there are many who fake it. I'm aware. And it's why even in the midst of a quote-unquote Christian generation, there's a generation coming up who have no idea who God is. Because sadly, there's a lot of guys out there who fake it. And no one knows a fake better than children in their house. It, it, think about it. There's, there's all kinds of uh, paradoxes in this world, all kinds of paradoxes. And one of them is children who are the easiest to fool. That's why playing a joke on a child is so easy. It's easy to fool a child. They don't know everything yet. But I want to tell you, if you try to fake it, they'll figure you out before you realize it. Isn't that interesting? Children know. Number one, you must be a man of God. Number two, you must be a loving husband. Number two, a loving husband. If we would communicate our faith to the next generation, 
You must be, number one, a man of God, number two, a loving husband, and then number three, a good leader, a good leader. These are the simple truths that we must embrace if we would communicate the faith in God to the next generation. And woe to the generation that rises up who does not know God. Number one, because the error of mankind serves to correct itself. I want to tell you, when we experience all the horrible uh, results of going to our own sinful ends and means, we suffer and find out, well, actually, that wasn't a good way to go after all. It doesn't have to be that way. But when we disobey God, sooner or later you find out the empty worthlessness of what we've embraced in place of God's will and God's way. But next comes the judgment of God if we give ourselves over to departing from him in his ways. But God has always left himself a remnant. As a matter of fact, God seeks an awfully, a godly offspring. We read about that in the book of Malachi. God is looking for children who love him. By the way, that's the answer. More than once in my ministry, I've had a man come up to me and say to me, I would not want to have to raise up children at this particular time in history. And some people embrace that kind of thinking as if that's how somehow better is to not have children. Well, let me first of all, before I address that kind of wrong thinking, let me just first of all address God says he seeks a godly offspring. God said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. And so to the degree that God blesses you with children, because not every family has children, some can, some can't, God blesses all of them who keep their eyes on him, but God blesses families with children. He wants us to have children. Do you think God would call us to have children and then not equip, enable us to raise up those children to know him? That's this part over here. That's faulty thinking. It doesn't matter how bad the times are. God's grace is greater than the sin that we face. And so young parents, young families, take heart. No matter what you have to face, God is omnipotent, God is omniscient, and God is omnipresent. And I take that to mean you don't have to worry about raising your children at any time if you look to the Lord. That's why, number one, a father must be a godly man. The top priority for communicating our faith to the next generation is to be the real deal and not a hypocrite or a fake, as I said earlier. Because you may fool a lot of people, but you will not fool your family. And I tell you what I said about your children, you're not fooling your wife. Isn't that interesting? But we deceive ourselves sometimes. Being a man of God first will provide a spiritual stability in your home. Do you realize that? A sense of stability and security comes to the home of a man who purpose in his heart to be a man of God. Now, there is a dilemma, and that dilemma in communicating our faith to the next generation gets realized right away by a man who says, I want to be a godly man, and by God's grace, I purpose to order my life that my relationship with God is number one. Now I face a dilemma. What's that dilemma? Well, each and every one of your children gets to make their own decision. <laughs> you cannot decide the eternal destiny of your children. You can decide whether or not they finish the food in their plate. You had better make some of those decisions. But you can't decide their eternal destiny. You can't do that. We have a phrase that's been popular for hundreds of years, and that is you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make the horse drink. It talks about the same issue. It talks about the very same issue. You cannot cause your children to decide one way or the other, but you can influence their decision tremendously. And that's what I want to communicate to us today. When a man purposes to make God first and foremost, he has the opportunity to influence his children by means of wetting their appetite. We heard this morning in our scripture reading in Psalm 34, verses 8 and 9, these words, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for there is no want to those who fear him. When a person enters into a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, I know I'm a sinner 
And I know I, res I deserve the judgment of God, but I also have learned that Jesus, when he died on that cross and shed his blood, he died to save me. And you cry out to him, Jesus, I want you to save my soul. God will do that. God answers the simple prayer of faith. When you do that, and you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and then you begin to enter into growing in your spiritual relationship with the Lord. I want to know all about you, so I read the Bible, and I learn what God loves. I learn what God hates, and I learn what God does. I even learn how God does what he does. I even learn what God's going to do. All these things God's revealed in his word, and as I learn those things, it changes me. God changes me. He'll change any man who purposes that he wants to know the Lord. And I want to tell you, when you taste the Lord, it's interesting that God uses one of the physical senses to speak about sensing God in a spiritual way, isn't it? Taste. How do you taste? Nothing could be more practical. I see all the foods laid out on the buff buffet table, and while they all look good to me, I really don't know how they're good or not good until I taste it. And then I'm like, mmm, I'm going back for more of that. That's what the Word of God is talking about. As you give your heart to God and want to know Him and enter into a relationship with Him, God will satiate your spiritual palate and He'll expand your spiritual palate and in your heart, you will say, I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Let me, because God is never lacking in patience. Did you know that? God is never lacking in strength. Did you know that? God is never lacking in wisdom. I lack in all those things. I don't know about you. But when I come to God and ask, he gives liberally to those who ask him in faith. Generously. And then I taste and I see that the Lord is good. Even when I go through the hardships of life, things that I wish that had never happened or so-and-so had never said. I wish that this or that had never happened, but it did happen. And so in all my hurts, I run to God. And he gives me comfort like no earthly bomb can ever touch. He can give comfort to my heart as in no other way. Anyone else says, falls short. But God will satisfy and God will minister. God will heal. He even heals the broken heart. God's able to do all those things. But when you experience that, the wisdom of God, the healing of God, the strength of God. I want to tell you, it's like having ice cream, only better. Taste and see that the Lord is good and you want some more. I want to tell you something. If you, by God's grace, are seeking to allow God to satiate your appetite like that, your family's going to go, what is that? I, I want to try some of that. Yes, taste and see that the Lord is good. And so fathers... Don't be afraid to pray. Lead your families in prayer. Don't, I don't care if you don't feel comfortable. I might not know the right words to pray. I want to tell you, if you pray from your heart, God's the prayer God wants to hear. And when your family has the opportunity to hear the prayers from your heart, and then they have the opportunity to see how God worked because you cried out to God from the depths of your heart, then they get to taste and see that the Lord is good. And I want to tell you, I used ice cream as silly as it is as an illustration, but I used ice cream because when I've got a good kind of ice cream in the house, most everyone else in my house is interested. Is it that way in your house? Mmm, mom brought home some cookies. Or mom, better yet, cooked up a cake for my birthday. When you are willing to taste it and children see that you experience it's good, and then they taste it, and they experience it's good. You know what you're doing? You're predisposing your children to say, I want this great God who can help, who can heal, who can comfort, who can encourage. Don't you want some of this? I tell you, everyone does, whether they're willing to admit it or not. Pride keeps us from admitting the deep needs of our soul. What a sad thing. But fathers... If we would but be a man of God, and I'm not saying be perfect. We often hear that and we think, oh, he's calling us to be something I could never be. Nothing is further from the truth. God knows you're not perfect. Is that okay? Don't kid yourself. Your wife knows you're not perfect. 
The problem is whether or not you're willing to admit it and come to God and find and allow God to do a work in your heart to cause you to grow and expand your character. Expand His working in and through your life. It takes humility for that. It takes great humility. But I want to tell you, if you purpose, I want to be a man of God. Not perfect. I want to be a man of God. God will lead you and grow you. And you know what he'll do? He'll bring your family with you if it's genuine. He'll do that. He'll do that. And so we appreciate the fact that while there's a dilemma, there's a great opportunity. And the opportunity does not start with me yelling and screaming and trying to rope my family in and tie them up. And it begins with me giving my heart to God and purpose to pursue an awesome God and then watch him whet the appetite of my family to follow. Do you know that most people like victory? Did you know that? Did you know that most sport teams know that when the team is winning, everything's great? And when the team is losing, we just see all the problems, and largely those problems are there. They were there even when things were going great. But when things are going great and you're winning, something's working right, and people tend to overlook the flaws, don't they? If you know any team, if you followed any team, you know that's true. But as soon as things start falling apart, and if it's a team sport, it's usually because of selfishness. <laughs> Instead of team, it's me, I want, whatever. If it's an individual sport, it's usually lack of diligence and practice and things like that. Uh, it could be human weakness. There's many things, obviously. But what I'm trying to illustrate to you men is you don't have to be perfect to be a man of God. To be a man of God, what you do is you just give your heart to God and say, Lord, I love you, and I want to follow you. I believe you. I'm going to believe you. And I want to allow you to work in my life to grow me to be the man that you will enable me to be. That's a whole lot different than thinking I have to be perfect. None of us are perfect. Even blessed Job, whom God called blameless, was not a perfect man. But I'll tell you this, he was a godly man. And when situations got difficult, he turned to God in prayer. And when he suffered, he gave praises to God. That's a godly man. And that's a man that God did a mighty work in his heart. And Job knew. He said, when I am tried with the fire, I shall come forth as gold. It's the work of God in a man's life. So don't think being a godly man means somehow we're going to all put ourselves on a pedestal and be this thing that nobody can be. No, it means humbly I give my heart to God and I say, Lord, you're going to be number one. Uh, help me to understand what that means, but you're going to be number one. I'm going to look to you. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to pray and read your words so I know what you're telling me and I'm going to follow you. That's the man of God. And God will change you. If you're willing to do that, watch what God will do in your life to change you. And then watch what God will do with the people around you when they taste and see that the Lord is good because a man has done that. And please be reminded, though there are dilemmas and there are difficulties, there is help. There is help with communicating our faith to the next generation. The Lord told Zerubbabel in the Old Testament to the nation of Israel when they came back from the cap captivity and the judgment that he brought forth on his people, a judgment that destroyed Jerusalem, a judgment that burned the temple, a judgment that turned Jerusalem into a wasteland, so they had to draw lots to get more people to be even be willing to live in that city limits. It was so bad. And here's Zerubbabel, and he's charged with rebuilding the temple when they come back. And what did God say to him through the prophet Zechariah? God said, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. God will enable any man who in sincerity and faith is looking to him to do everything that God wants that man to do. I want to tell you, man, that takes a lot of pressure off. God will call us to do difficult things, but he's not looking for your shoulders. He's looking for your heart, and the Spirit of God will enable the man who's looking to him, not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Now, a little bit of an advertisement. Come back tonight at 6 o'clock, and we'll consider not to the strong as the battle, not to the swift as the race, 
but that's tonight. I still got two more points. Lastly, under the same point, I'm still under point number one, doesn't matter. These are so important. God provides the strength we need by his Holy Spirit, and the man of God who loves God and is looking to God will experience the enabling comfort, strength, and power of God in their life, God's grace by his Spirit. He will learn that. God will teach you that. But let me warn you, be a man of God and not a man of self. The problem that we have is self. We're so selfish and we're so self-centered. And I want to teach you, if you purpose that you want to be a man of God, God's going to help you to unlearn that selfishness. And he's going to want to teach you selflessness. That's what God wants to do. The word of God warns us, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit. That's the spirit of God. And the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you cannot do the things you wish. If we are going to live selfishly, then we are going to find failure and foibles and have all kinds of problems. But if we would realize that the help comes from God, the godly man then presents himself to the Lord as a living sacrifice, and the Spirit of God will lead him, guide him, and enable him, and help him, even when he digs his own ditch and falls into it. God will help you. Because his spirit helps those who look to him. And may God help us to have godly men and whet the appetites of their children. Let me just briefly touch these others. Uh, number two, he must be a loving husband. Another necessary element of communicating our faith to the next generation is to properly fulfill the biblical roles that God has given to you. If you're a son, if you're a daughter, if you're a wife, if you're an aunt, if you're a grandma, Whatever person you are in whatever state, the Word of God has something to say about the roles, how he would have us to fill that role. We're talking about dads today. And the Word of God tells dads, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And I want to tell you that when a man loves his wife the way God tells us to, and I'm just going to give brief little bits of description about that in just a minute, I want to tell you he provides an emotional stability in his home. I want you to hear this loud and clear. The culture all about us knows what happens to broken homes to the children. There's no emotional stability in those homes. They're hurting. They're looking. They're looking for healthy relationships because they aren't finding them in the family. Men, if we would be number one for God and then take seriously the role that he's given to us, that means we have to love our wives. And that means it's a privilege and a wonderful, blessed responsibility to love our wives. And you may say, well, you don't know my wife. I probably don't. But I know the Savior, Jesus Christ. And he knows your wife better than you do. And he's the one who will give great grace to men to love their wives in the same way that Christ loved the church. By the way, that's a sacrificial love. You must set aside self and put your wife first. Hmm. I don't think that gets repeated out there when they make fun of preachers today. That this is what we teach. They like to leave that out. But God tells us to put it in. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That means sacrificial. That means you're willing to lay yourself down so that your wife can be provided for, taken care of in every way. I want to tell you, when a husband loves his wife that way, it provides an emotional stability in the home and a security. And, and let me tell you, the world will start to be hungry for that when they see a home, a well-ordered home, where there's love, healthy doses of love in that home because all these sins that people embrace in the name of selfishness end up destroying the home and end up destroying that emotional stability that God intends for families to have. And it starts with love. And husbands are called to love their wives. But not only, also in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28, not only does God say, husbands, love your wives in the same way that Christ loved the church. Oh, by the way, I'm doing brief sentences, so it's tough to get them all in. If you're an honest father, you may say to me, that's impossible. I can't love my wife the same way Christ loved the church. And if we were just talking about the ability of our flesh, I acknowledge that we fall far short. But remember the help? 
not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. God has not called us to do anything that he will not enable us to do by his spirit who dwells within if we put him first. Do you see how the dots are connected? God will enable us to love our wives in a way that will bring tremendous emotional stability in our home. Now the second one in verse 28 of Ephesians 5, we read, Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And this is to love my wife beneficially, or if I could say, in a kind way. That is, I treat her the same way I would treat myself. I hope you treat her better than that. But so often we fall short of that. We're very careful to make sure our wives know what our favorite dish is. Do you know what your wife's favorite fill-in-the-blank is? Love your wives as you love yourself. Some men are so careful to have, every one of us is different, I know, God created us all different, but some men are so careful to have the best tools, they're all organized, everything. You can ask them, they've got the tool, they know right where it is, it's organized, but they could care less about taking care of the needs of their wife. I want to tell you, that's a home where there's a lot of a lack of emotional stability. God says to love your wife the same way you love yourself. Show the wife, uh, the, 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 the wife of your youth that God has given to you the same care that you show yourself. This points back to the importance of not being selfish, but being selfless. That's what God says to us, men. Love your wives the way Christ loved the church and love your wives in a beneficial way in the way that you live, uh, the way that you love and take care of yourself. Thirdly, we must be a good leader. You can't ignore this. It is important to, number one, be a man of God. It's, number two, important to make sure you love your wife. But number three, you have to be a good leader in your home. In order to effectually communicate your faith to the next generation, we must be good leaders. As a matter of fact, God calls on those who are leaders in the church to be good leaders in their home. We read in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children well and their own houses well. This is an expectation of God that we have an ability to order our homes. And so it's important that we, number one, set a good example. Number two, we must be men of truth and integrity. In other words, keep your word. Keep your word. I was blessed years ago, years ago, the man who shared it with me, a pastor who's now home with the Lord, I asked him a question as I faced the challenges of life that were pulling me in so many different directions. And, and I was trying to balance my home with my work. And, this, and so I said, how do you deal with that in the ministry? And he said, well, he said, when you make an appointment for church, do you keep it? I said, well, yeah, I have to do that. He said, that's the way you treat your family. He said, if you make an appointment with your family, you keep it. That's integrity. That's integrity. People who only say what they mean and then carry through with what they say they're going to do. And I want to tell you, this is an important part of leadership that's so missing. Just ask your company wherever you work. It matters to them what you say, if you're going to follow through or not, doesn't it? So much more in the home. God purposes to build strong marriages so that there can be strong families. And strong families lead to strong churches. And strong churches can lead to a strong nation. We're seeing it fall apart right from the very beginning. And I want to tell you, Satan knows that. Satan knows if he can just destroy your married relationship. Satan knows if he can just destroy your family. There's a domino effect of things that topple. And so we must understand that these foundational, simple things are of utmost importance if we would see God put things together in a way that brings glory to his holy name. And we're talking about communicating our faith to the next generation. I want to tell you, I'm skipping to the end. There's a, I got two more hours. I want to tell you, in our culture about us, your children are not going to learn about God outside there anymore. Do you realize that? It hasn't been that way. I can just, in my own lifetime, stoop back to the 1980s 
And it was much different than it is now. Don't tell me how many decades have gone by in between. I don't want to know. In the 1980s, I had to be in West Virginia, I know that, but I went to a restaurant that had a Bible open on a platform as you walked into the restaurant. And earlier, into the 1960s, there were all kinds of places that people could learn about God if they didn't in the family. But I want to tell you, all that's been changing over the last four decades. And I want to tell us, men, that if we do not establish the truth of God in our home, it's very difficult to find it out there. There's still a few rocks you can turn over and find it, but it's changing. But I want to warn you that your family is going to be torn apart by all the institutions that are out there, especially the educational institutions, are ripping and tearing at every foundational truth that we've talked about in this message and many, many more. If you are not going to purpose to have a godly home, how is it possible? It's an interesting thing, isn't it? Well, I'll tell you this. God is possible. He can do anything. Praise his holy name. But I want to tell you, we will not be effective in communicating our faith to the next generation if we don't establish it in our home. We'll lose the opportunity and the privilege that we have to fulfill this wonderful work of God. And that's a sad thing. May God encourage our hearts to do what? Be a man of God. Love your wife. And be a good leader. And let me tell you, because I didn't have time, if you struggle with leadership, there's lots of helps. Lots and lots of helps. All you have to do is ask. There's lots of people, lots of information, who are more than willing to give you a hand to be a leader. And leadership looks different for everybody. Just read history. All kinds of historical examples of different kinds of leadership. But they understood that there needed to be a leader. If you follow Christ, he'll develop you to be a leader, because that's what he wants. May God help and encourage our hearts. The Lord says in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, He said to the nation of Israel, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And I want to tell you today, our Lord God will help those men who look to him, who are trusting in him, to be all that God would have you to be. May God bless us and encourage and strengthen us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the truth of your word. And as we've just reflected on some of these truths, I pray that your spirit will bring them home to our hearts by way of encouragement to realize how important it is to establish our home as a place where Jesus Christ is lifted up and exalted and the righteousness of God is respected and the God of heaven and earth is reverenced and I pray, Father, that you would have mercy upon us and whet the appetite of our children to want to know you and to want to follow you. And for you, O Lord, to you, O Lord, we'll give you great thanks for these things. In Jesus' name, amen.